and we are now live. Welcome to today's talk. So let's see, people are arriving, brilliant. As you arrive, if you could just pop into the chat where you're joining us from today, and please make sure that it says to all panelists and attendees so we can all read what you're saying. Um, I'll start off. I, um, There we go. If you can just drop into the chat where you're joining us from, it's really good for us to uh, see where everybody is. We've got four people joining us here and we've got 80 book time. So we're going to just wait a while while everyone gets in the room and gets settled. And for the uh, panellists, why don't you join in and let us know where you're joining us from. Oh, we've got from Darbados from Birmingham. Darbados is our, our little nickname for Derby, for those of us who work there. Sunny Darbados. Montreal. Mm. How, what time is it there? Uh, 9.52. 9.52. Peter from Ilford, Wolverhampton, Manchester. Brilliant. Well, we're going to be starting in about seven or eight minutes. We've just gone live on Facebook, so some of you are joining us there. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can also pop into your Facebook comments. Let us know where you're joining us from. As the talk goes on, we're going to be asking you to keep conversation to the chat and any questions for the speakers, panellists to pop into the Q&A, which you should see a Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom bar. So if you just make sure that everybody has got their ch chat set to all panellists and attendees, because at the moment a lot of these chats are just coming through to us. We want everyone to be able to see them. So yeah, if you can have a little extra go at redoing that for some of you and make sure that everyone can see these. Hi Helena, glad you can join us. So yeah, about five minutes till we start and hello to everyone on Facebook as well. I can just see your little new kitten in your over your shoulder, Neve. <laughs> <laughs> the new audience attendee. There's this kind of period of, of the warming up to the chat always reminds me of the, the, the time you sit in the aeroplane before takeoff. Mm. Yeah. Oh, your snacks. This is a lot safer though. <laughs> yeah, for the moment. Thanks, Helena. You got it right, yeah. Un annoyingly the chat's always set just to panellists so you're just talking to us and often if we're talking to the screen we don't necessarily see the chat so it's good if everyone can make sure it's to panellists and all attendees so you can discuss the talk amongst yourselves as well and also any links that are discussed during the talk I'll be dropping them into chat today. So if you're just joining us, please let us know where you're joining from. It'd be good to know which countries or where in the country you're representing. And we're live on Facebook, aren't we? Yep. Brilliant. Oh, so Amanda from Sunderland joining us on Facebook. Hi, Sunderland. But so far, we've got Manchester, Wolverhampton, Birmingham, Montreal, Derby, Derbyshire, West Midlands, Paris. Mm, very nice, Sue. It's nice to have an international audience. One of the great things about the Zoom talks. Birmingham, brilliant. And I've got a few people joining from Manchester who are having another lockdown this week. I really feel for you guys. I've got Sean from Todd Morden. Hi, Sean. Sean, one of our speakers a few weeks ago. If you'd like to see Sean's talk, it is on our YouTube channel. The today's talk will be going up there as well. So the talk will be live on Zoom and Facebook, and then later on it will go up onto YouTube. They can all be accessed via the format website as well in the archive section. Brilliant. She'll pop a link. I 
I shall put a link up now to our archive area. Here we are. We've got Joe joining us from Teesdale on Facebook. Hi, Joe. Can you make sure that your chat is set to panelists and attendees, everyone, if you're just joining us? If you're just joining us, there's a few more people arrived in the room, please pop in the chat to all panelists and attendees where you're joining us from. Um, we'll be using the chat to talk amongst ourselves to discuss um, what we're talking about and the panelists and also share any links to the websites that we're discussing. Um, and then the Q&A function, which you should be able to see in the bottom bar, please put any questions for the speakers into there. Hi Sue, thanks for your coming. Nice to reconnect, hope you're doing well. Alfonso is joining us from Italy. Lovely. Hope the weather's better, better than it is here. It's just raining outside. Hello from Bristol. Jackie from Leicester. Brilliant. We're a few minutes off starting. There is still time to get a cuppa, some water, get yourself comfortable. <laughs> Is this the seventh talk now, I think, possibly? Yeah. The format live ones. I should know this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Time's gone on, I think, the lockdowns. Yeah. That's been a huge amount of time. So we've been doing them almost every other week, haven't we, for quite a long time now. And uh, yeah. some incredible speakers have joined us, and including our amazing team today. If you'd like to see any of our past talks, you can find them via the Format website archive and this talk will be going there as well afterwards. So, hello from Newcastle, from Lincoln. Brilliant. So a few more minutes, we're nearly coming up to the hour and we'll be starting shortly. is um, broadcasting to you from Quad as well. So Quad is going to reopen on the 7th of September. So if anybody's in the area who wants to make a trip up, uh, we'll be ready to look after you when you come in. Also social distancing measures in place. It's very exciting to be open to the public again in September. Since March, it's been such a long time. Yeah, yeah. But being back here, it's almost like nothing's happened. It's kind of been a bad dream. It's still continuing, but uh, <laughs> we're slowly getting used to how, uh, living living with it. Oh, John Legg's joining us. Hi, John. John from Nottingham. Um, yeah, that's it. Keep your chat into the chat and just use the Q&A for questions. John is one of our amazing photography tutors at um, Quad and Format. So really great to see you joining us here today. I've got Michael Sanders from Lincolnshire. Helen has asked when you got back into the office, Louise. I think it's been open for a few weeks now, hasn't it? For um, on and off, yeah, just just occasional when we need to. So we were here for the portfolio reviews that we did recently. Um, I'm here today for this, um, but most of us are working from home and um, slowly gearing up to how we're going to put 70 people together in one office, um, <laughs> considering the ways that we need to work um, uh, caused by the virus. So at the moment we're just coming in to do things now and again, getting ready for reopening. But yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not opening until 7th of September for the public, generally speaking. So most of us are still working from home. And um, yeah, yeah, like a ghost ship at the moment, but it's, it's a good time to, um, you know, plaster the cracks in the walls and, and get things ready that we don't normally have time to do when we've got the public in every day. So it's, um, we're making the most of the situation. I see who else has joined us. Uh, Caroline's joined us. Caroline Malloy, hi, from London. Claire from Wet Edinburgh. Diego from Bristol. Um, Rachel Mason from Manchester. Hi, Rachel, who's also used to work with Format. Um, Anthony uh, from British Columbia, 7 a.m. That's great that you're joining us bright and early over your breakfast, possibly. Thank you for joining so early in the morning. <laughs> Joe from Teesdale, brilliant. So it's just coming up to the hour, so maybe wait one more minute, just make sure people are settled in. 
Um, we often get a few more joining us just as the hour turns and people suddenly go, oh, it's three o'clock, I'm missing my Zoom. Um, we'll get everyone settled in and then we'll hand over to the panellists. Um, Dave's joining us from Shrewsbury. Hi, Dave. Really great to see who's joining us today. If you've just joined us, please drop into the chat where you're joining us from. And the Q&A is going to be used during the talk just for questions to the speakers. So if you could keep your chat in the chat and questions in the Q&A, and I will be interrupting our speakers at various points to ask them your questions. You can ask questions anytime during um, the talks. If it fits into what they're talking about right now, we'll look at your question. Otherwise, we might save some of them for the end. Oh, who else has joined us? We've got Henry from Boston, Massachusetts. What time is it there, Henry? We'd love to know. Um, Stephen's joining us from Birmingham. Um, we've got Farah Chowdhury joining us. Hi, Farah. Uh, Zoe Wishaw from London. Oh, Alicia Bruce from Edinburgh. Hi, Alicia. Um, Marley from Birmingham. Hampton, brilliant. Denise from Brighton, everyone's arriving. Brilliant. We've got a really great coverage of the country and lots of people joining us at odd hours across the world, which is brilliant. Hi, Justin from Birmingham. Can you just check everyone? Some of you are sending your chat just through to panelists. I want everyone to be able to see it. So just check your little blue tag where it should say all panelists and attendees so everyone can see the chat. Once the talk gets started in a minute, we're going to be just keeping the chat. If someone's saying something you want to add something to, stick it into the chat. If you've got a question for the speakers, pop it into the Q&A. Brilliant. Well, it's three minutes past the hour. Everyone's settling in. I'm going to hand over to um, today's speakers. I will just be here in the background managing a bit of tech and Q&As. I'm going to hand over to Format Director Louise Pedroff clements Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Neve, and um, thanks to all the reframed uh, team for joining us today as well. Um, so I'm, I'm really here just to chair the discussion a little bit and um, to give a brief intro to who, we're, who we have with us today. Um, so we have um, reframed, so this is the team here. Um, it's a Midlands-based network for Black, Asian and other people of colour that are interested in producing photographic visual art. It's been established by a team of award-winning photographers, curators, all who believe that visual arts can play a critical role in shaping civic and contemporary attitudes, initiating collabor collaborative conversations and changing prevailing thoughts about race, our local environment and our communities. That's no mean feat. Um, big, big, um, incredible intentions, amazing ambition, and um, really, really excited to to see what what you guys do with, as part of your your programs. Um, so everyone will talk about their career path into becoming a creative practitioner, followed by, by more information about reframed, about how it came together, um, um, why it came together, and about the project, focus, ambitions, and plans. And I'll chip in along the way to ask. Um, any questions um, as we go and some questions at the end and also as Debbie said any audience questions and um, do put them into the Facebook chat and to this chat here into zoom as well um, and yes so I'll start off with uh, introducing our speaker so we have Seba Chowdhury who's um, one of my greatest friends and um, long-term collaborator um, and colleague on our global adventures, but also working alongside me on, on format for many years as well and still together with us on various freelance projects as well, Super Seb. Um, and uh, so she's a freelance creative producer with experience in working international world-class festivals, projects and events. Currently community engagement officer Tape Letters, which is an amazing project that explores the practice of sending and receiving messages by cassette tape as a mode of communication. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell you tell us a little bit more about that when you come to your talk, won't you, Seb? What's that? Um, and she's previously creative producer of um, British Council funded project, the photo gallery place I call home, um, which worked all over the Gulf region and the UK incredible project that works in seven countries and the curated multiple exhibitions. She's also a freelance curator with artists like Alina Casina at Diffusion Festival in Wales and um, we recently organised the world's first large-scale online major portfolio review with um, over 300 meetings in one day on Zoom and, and Picture as a platform which is a, an amazing amazing achievement um, but 
she looks fun more when she comes to talk about herself. Um, Andrew Jackson, welcome as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Andrew Jackson's work um, looks at uh, selfhood, representation, narration within intimate and personal interventions, focus on transnational migration, belonging, displacement and collective memory, and many other subjects. Um, he's an art historian professor, uh, has written um, kind of around British life and immigration and um, Jackson's work restores humanity to people whom this critical characteristic has been routinely withheld or withdrawn from. Um, so an incredible artist um, and um, is a recipient of month-long light work autograph um, International Photography res Residency in Syracuse in New York. Um, it's an MA in documentary photography at Newport and many other things that you all expand on as well. Works held in multiple collections worldwide and a qualified lecturer and uh, co-founder, co-director of IC Visual Lab, some cities and participatory photography within the UK is also part of, of what, he, what he looks at and does. Um, Anand Chabra, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Also, Andrew, you're, you're in, um, where, are you, where are you broadcasting from? You're, uh, you're Montreal at the moment. Montreal, so thanks for joining us. It's early in the morning though, isn't it? I think, uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> Early-ish, not too bad. No, um, um, and Anand, thank you, thanks for joining us. Um, Anand is co-founder, director of um, Black Country Visual Arts, which is an incredible organisation that's um, been, been active last few, few years, um, all over the middle part of the UK. Um, and you've initiated and profiled Apna Heritage Archive, um, which is an award-winning project for the best new archive um, for community, community archives and, and heritage related. Um, collection of images. Um, you've been shortlisted for Magnum Foundation's Photography and Collaboration uh, Migration Religion Related Award, um, nominated for Pre-Pictay and um, a recent award winner at our Portfolio Review as well. And uh, uh, you've worked with organisations broad ranging as the National Trust, Arts Council England, um, Worcestershire Archaeological Archives, um, Service, British Council, and so on. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing more when you come along to do your talk. Um, Jagdish, welcome. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, so Jagdish is, a, how would you describe you, a curator, artist, cultural entrepreneur, as many of us seem are here today. Um, so you're interested in issues relating to socially engaged art, anti-racism and archives. Um, you grew up in the Midlands, worked in London, um, Deputy Director of Human Rights Charity, um, the Monitoring Group, um, and your work is firmly located in realms of portraiture and documentary, but through a process of collaborative art collaborative art practices. Um, much of your work involves working with working class communities and you're keen to ensure that the process of making images is empowering for the people taking part as well as um, yeah, representing their voices in, in the process and in the, the final outcomes as well. Um, in the past few years you've undertaken projects from uh, relating to the gypsy community, Portuguese farm workers, Asian football clubs, Northern Soul fans, victims of, of racial violence, Muslim war veterans and Punjabi bar owners in the black country and, um, and well-being and mental health. Uh, you have a MA in photography from De Montfort in Leicester and um, Yes, you're engaged with with local arts organisation like Primary and um, uh, work associate member of RPS, Royal Photographic Society, and one of the founders of Off Centre, which is Nottingham um, based centre for photography and social engagement that also does a festival as well. So we are starting with um, Andrew is going to kick off with the first um, introduction to himself and, and um, then we'll work through the group and then we'll have a broaden out the discussion to reframe and uh, also the bursary winners which you're excited to hear more about thank you just going to share the screen i guess um i got into photography uh, uh i guess in my kind of teenage years and uh, it wasn't until I, I i did a degree at wolverhampton university under nick hedges that I guess I kind of saw the potency of photography and my kind of early early kind of years I really wanted to be uh, a photojournalist and I wanted to this idea that I was going to 
go off into the world and and write these social wrongs through my images and it kind of early projects you you know when you're doing uh, documentary photography courses you do the usual things you do the boxing the homeless etc did a body of work on uh, firefighters and if 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 i'm really honest that in those early times i got became addicted to the experience uh, it was the idea that this the, the camera was a an entry point to other people's lives and uh, you know if i kind of walked down the street and i stopped and stared at somebody um, they would uh, think that something was wrong but with that camera if i went up to them and asked them a question could i take your photograph they would engage with me they'd either say yes or they say no but there'd be an engagement and if they said yes there'd be uh, an uh, an access to that person's lives it might be only be for five minutes or ten minutes but a relationship develops and i guess I, I became addicted to the idea of what access the camera could do at that point so as i kind of said at this labor under the pretense that i wanted to be a photojournalist and also kind of harbored these ideas that i wanted to be a war photographer it sounds odd to say that now after all of these years but i guess it was i had the opportunity to go to uh, south africa cape town and i ended up doing the work in a in a, a emergency trauma unit and i spent six days there and i kind of realized that this uh, perhaps wasn't for me uh, and i guess one point this body of work which wasn't just about this hospital it was also about um i decided i was doing the work around um the, the cape town as a space and i started this um work which kind of uh, looked at the similarities i didn't want to do a work which was which i kind of seen uh, quite a quite many times where these kind of jarring juxtapositions of black white and within black and white photography which for wide angle lens and so forth. I wanted to do something which explored the space, but looked at the space in terms of similarities. So whether you're living in a, a gated community or whether you live in a township, um, you have a domestic environment, you have a domestic life. And so I kind of just photographed uh, the spaces in similar ways. I did a series of portraits, which were democratic portraits, I call them in the sense that people were all photographed in the same eye line. In terms of captioning, I kind of uh, used the, the racial classification or the racial classification which the individual told me they wanted to be used by. So black man and then geographical location. And so I didn't put name, I didn't put occupations or so forth. I didn't want to, to I guess, force those um, um, hierarchies onto the audience, even though the audience would come to their own conclusions depending on what was in the frame. So I was doing this work. Um, one of the elements aspects of it, one of the tropes was hands. And um, because hands, uh, because of there were 11 national um, uh, uh, languages in South Africa, hands seemed to be the universal form of communication. You know, a clenched fish could talk about hatred, violence, aggression hands holding could talk about love or you know friendship and so in many sequences hands um, kind of factored into the the um narrative but i when i came back to england i realized that you know maybe this wasn't my story to tell because um the the images and the people were backdrops to my own experience and i kind of thought about you know how could I move on and uh, create works which perhaps discuss my experience? And the, the work was exhibited in, in Warsaw. One of the things, one of the another kind of uh, features of the work, or the tropes of the work, was I wanted these really small uh, images, and they were seven by five, and they were in a box frame in, in, in a sense that, you know, the, the audience had to have a personal and intimate relationship with each image. Only one person could look at the image at the same time. And you know the, that distance between the audience and the image was increased by the box frame. So I guess as um, uh, I did a work where Eddie Chambers, uh, um, professor at University of Texas, had kind of talked about uh, the work I did, and he talked about how, in one sense, photography, particularly in Britain, hasn't um, been too kind in terms of its representation of uh, 
racialized communities. You know, if you think about um, uh, since 1826, the very first photograph, uh, if you think about all those photographs held in art collections and museums and printed in newspapers uh, since, you know, the, within the history of photojournalism, how many of those photographs of black people have actually been taken by black people? You know, who are those photographs for? Um, who, who are they, you know, who are designed to, con to consume those photographs? And, you know, when that, that's one of the basic problems of documentary, perhaps, is that, you know, uh, you have one group of people looking at it, often another group of less powerful people for the consumption, again, of those powerful people. And which, I guess, this one quote, I guess, also leads us to think about um, reframed and what reframed might be wanting to do uh, in uh, future years. But I guess, um, you know, I'm not really sure what uh, portraits can tell us. Um, uh, Gary Winogrand talks about portraits, uh, talking about photography, just as a, the recording of um, light and surface. And, you know, in, in that same respect, a portrait is just uh, the recording and rendering of light falling onto a human form. You know, sometimes you could argue that um, a portrait is just, uh, it's a construction, you know, it's a construct by the, by the photographer, which the audience then, I guess, view by overlaying their own stereotypical points of view onto the, onto the, onto the image. What does it reveal? I don't know, but there's something about the intimacy of the relationship between, um, me and, and the people who are photographing, which I, I think I find intriguing. But also I think what the camera, what photography can do, it can humanize people. Uh, it can, I guess, uh, act as a bridge between individuals. And, but uh, I guess uh, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by uh, portraits. Again, I'm not really sure what they show us, but just gonna come uh, talk about uh, a body of work which I'm developing and have developed. It's, it's in three stages and the first stage was uh, from a small island and it's really about exploring, it started off as exploration of my parents' uh, migration from the Caribbean to the UK and it was just initially just about uh, my parents and it was all photographed initially inside the four walls of their homes and their physical decline, uh, I was going to mirror with the physical decline of the industry or the region which they were going to, which they came to work in. And as the work developed, the work uh, expanded to include uh, Jamaica, but also um, my connection to space. You know, um, I guess early stages of my life, I questioned my belonging to the UK. And when I questioned that belonging, I kind of, um, uh, sought um, sanctuary in my parents' stories about Jamaica. And I was intrigued by the space. And I was intrigued by, um, I guess, the potency for the experiences and how it still lingered on to affect them. And I always believed that, listening to my mother's stories in particular, which were mainly about Jamaica, that she never really uh, landed in the UK. She's always somewhere in that midpoint between Jamaica and the UK. And so that, that work kind of explored um, my kind of parents' uh, journey. And I, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about my parents particularly was that, you know, migration is always kind of posited as this kind of short-term problematic thing. It doesn't look or ask the questions of what happens when migrants stay and don't go home. Um, you know, my um, mom, you know, and my father, lived in the UK for longer than they ever lived in Jamaica, three times as much long, longer as they ever stayed. But also works about, you know, my migration don't, you know, uh, visualize the elderly experience of migrants. But he also doesn't, ex uh, usually works don't explore the human interpersonal relationships of uh, 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 migrants, I guess. And so the work enabled me to go back to Jamaica where I could uh, also explore my own connection to the space for the first time. And this, this is where the street where my mom uh, lived. But also while the work explored 
the what was of migration. It also looked at what could have been because my mom had the opportunity to move to Brooklyn, but she chose uh, the UK. And so I, I found the, the sidewalk where she was outside of the home she's going to live. And I kind of see, photographed it in the same way with the shadows um, outside of the home she left. But yeah, and so the, the work, I guess, as I kind of went to Jamaica uh, for the first time and just uh, uh, three years ago, you know, uh, as growing up in the UK, where as I mentioned, my sense of belonging was uh, in question. I went to Jamaica um, hoping that I'd uh, be able to uh, lay claim to a, a sense of a Jamaican identity. And I was quickly pointed out uh, that uh, you're, you're English. What do you what do you want here? And so, whilst in the UK all my life growing up, I was that Jamaican lad or Afro Caribbean, whatever. And somewhere down the line was was British. In uh, Jamaica, when I went to try and lay claim to this identity, I was quickly and abruptly told, "You're English. What do you want here?" So the work explored that. But and uh, so that as I kind of mentioned, there are two other chapters of the other work and one is called uh, from whence we came um, one is called the, the last days of summer the last days of summer as uh, a second chapter explores the um the kind of grandchildren the third uh, fourth generation of those migrants who came over in that post-war period and who kind of duly are coming to the end of their youths uh the end of the you know the, the, the description of being millennials are coming to an end and their youth are coming to an end at the same time when Britain is redrawing its immigration policies you know freedom of movement is ending um, uh, so Britain seems to be an experiment to redraw uh, reclaim Britain as a space of whiteness and um, just you know these young people are the legacy of those migrants who came over uh, well who came over as British citizens in that post-war period and the third series and final series uh, from whence we came looks at that desire to return and what that means and uh, it kind of stems from the fact uh, uh, which i guess uh, something which I, i've experienced in my life where people have told you why don't you go back home and it's that question it's a it's a question of belonging where is home and just i guess as i mentioned about my mother who even though she lived in england for 50 odd years and left uh, well, nearly nearly sixty years, and she left Jamaica when she was twenty. Um, and yet, she still considered herself Jamaican in one sense. You know, what is home? Where is home? And so, the the third chapter um, explores that. And this image is this image is the it's Kingston uh, Harbour where my mother left. Um, Jamaica for the UK and this is where the, the quote I, I put up earlier about she mentioned that that was the last time she saw her father and for all the remaining years you know she could never see his face when she thought about him and she she knew that, it, that she would never see him again even then even though her plan was just a five-year plan like many uh, Caribbeans with just a five-year plan to come to England make some money and go back home again but she knew that she wouldn't see him again because he began to cry and she'd never seen him cry before. And she kind of, there was a sense of, uh, there's a, yeah, the feeling that this was a edge of a uh, end of a chapter. And I don't know if you can notice in this image, there's a, un, under the bridge, there's somebody sleeping in the shade as the other person walks off into the, the distance. But I think, um, I'm kind of interested in notions of representation. I'm interested in notions of home and belonging, migration, and representation in terms of the fact of who who is taking a photograph and for whom. And you know, as I mentioned before, I think that reframed can um, you know have a have a have a role in challenging or creating opportunities for other people, other uh, 
individuals to share their experience through the through photography. And I think that might be a good place for me to um, hand over to Sabah if I can get out of this because my cursor has disappeared. Before you go, Andrew, okay. can I just ask you a question sure. from someone um, yeah. asking, can you share any books or publications that have shaped your practice? I think um, good. I guess two, two works, in, in, two bodies of works initially was uh, the first was um, work by Nick Edges called uh, Born to Work. And he, in the late 70s, early 80s, he did this black and white documentary essay on um, manufacturing industry in the West Midlands and its decline. And um, my kind of father worked in factories, both my mom and dad worked in factories. And uh, they both kind of told me these stories about, you know, the, you know, the horrific, um, it, you know, experience it was with them, the toil it took on them, you know, the, the, the physical toil. And the emotional toil, because when they first started in these factories, they, you know, faced racial abuse. You know, my, you know, they were paid differently from the white workers. Uh, there was, you know, life was not entirely easy, I guess. And I guess this was before I got into photography. And I, I, mean, I can tell you the story I was doing. I kind of messed up my exams at uh, school. I'd gone to Dudley College and I was doing a business course, which I had no interest in. I was skiving off in the library and I found uh, an old copy of the BJP, which had these images of Nick Hedges' work. And they just, you know, the, the idea that these images could tell stories, could, um, you know, could, uh, could share experiences. You know, obviously, you know, after the fact, you, you kind of think about the problematic aspects of documentary photography, but then it was, you know, something really appealing. Or I guess like another, like lots of other photographers, the other work was uh, Americans by Robert Frank. I, I, you know, that just, you know, it kind of, uh, it, it was a, a, an immediate uh, immersion into this man's journey across America, I guess. And it was, there's just one particular image, uh, I think it was trolley bus, I think, where, he, he's in, I think his New Orleans is in, and he's changing uh, his roll of film into his camera, puts a new roll in, looks up, and suddenly a trolley bus goes back. He raises his camera, takes a picture, and within these individual window, windows, there's this uh, social hierarchy of America in 1950, 1950s, which perhaps is still the same hierarchy now, where the first window is a white man, white woman, white boy, white girl, black man and black woman all captured it in their own individual framings all in the same space uh seemingly going in the same di same direction but all individualized and separated in this hierarchy and you know that that body of work really kind of blew me away and another, another photographic uh, uh, work or photographer was van lee burke and his I guess Im images of uh an experience closer to my own geographically and in, in, in reality, I guess. Uh, one image in particular was a, an image called The Boy in the Flag, uh, where there's this young guy, and I think it's a chopper bicycle in Hamburg Park, and he's got this Union Jack on the um, it's kind of handlebars. And uh, that particular image, I guess, raised a lot of questions, but it also seemed to answer a lot of questions. So, yeah those bodies of work. Lovely, thank you very much. I think you were just about to hand over to Seb there when I interrupted yeah. the question. Yeah. I should disappear so, again and jump back in if you have any more questions. Thank you so very much. Over to you. Thank so. you, Andrew. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Louise, for inviting us all to come and speak on here. It's really a uh, brilliant opportunity for us. I think you gave me a really great intro, so I think you probably should have done my presentation for me. Um, but I will actually share my own position. Thank you, Andrew, as well. It was a really great presentation. I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that, but I'm certainly going to try. Uh, if you just give me a second. Hopefully you can all see that. 
Uh, so I'm going to try and talk uh, somewhat briefly about my work history, uh, who I am, where I've got to, where I am. Uh, I'll try and be very um, honest as well, if I, as, as, as honest as I can. Uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, talk also about this failures as well and uh, the um, the hurdles that I faced along the way. Just so you know, this doesn't kind of happen overnight, uh, particularly to those who are you know, young producers or curators. Uh, so actually when I went to, uh, oh, I first got interested in photography when I went to school, I studied UCSC photography and then I went on to uh, college and did a BTEC National Diploma in Photography. Uh, when, I, when I went to school I was a very, I, was, I live in Birmingham and um, it was a very Asian uh, area, South Asian, a lot of uh, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and um, when I went to college it's completely different, it's very absolute contrast. It's uh, it was a very white college, certain cultural college, and um, I didn't really feel like, that, I, that I settled in very well when I was at college and the same at university. I kind of felt like an outsider and um, it was really difficult for me to kind of get into, um, you know, pe people at university, for example, I didn't really, you know, it was easy for me to make friends and I just felt like, I just felt like an outsider. But um, at the same time, I was working at Jessup's Photography Lab, which I really enjoyed and I learned a lot there and I started working at Rhubarb Rhubarb, which is the UK's first international photo festival. And um, I felt really welcomed by uh, the team there, Rhonda Wilson and Laura, Lorna Mary Webb. They're both really brilliant. They took me under the ring. They also felt really welcomed by the international photography community. And that's how I kind of got into working at photo festivals. And uh, that's where I actually met Louise and I met Anand there as well. Probably Andrew, but I don't remember. <laughs> Her memory is not too good. Uh, so in 2003, 2004, I volunteered at Rhubarb Rhubarb, and then every year I kind of started uh, working there. So they uh, they employed me as a freelance freelancer. So I worked at the festival every year, and I worked at various different exhibitions and events and projects I did throughout the year, uh, alongside working at Jessup. And I dropped out of university because I just wasn't enjoying that. Um, so I was working at Rhubarb Rhubarb, and I met a lot of people, and I really enjoyed it. Um, this is a festival from 2008. So the Portfolio Review is one of the biggest events they did. And uh, it's, a, it's an event that I still do to this day that I run. Um, so it's, I really love meeting people from all around the world. Uh, you see a lot of familiar faces. I think there might be Sean Bonal in the middle there, which I didn't really notice before until I prepared this. Um, well, I've known Sean for such a long time. There's Simon Bainbridge there as well. And I think it's Robert, Ra Robert Rauschenberg. No, Christopher Rauschenberg, son of Robert, right? I hope we got the right way around. Um, so, I worked for, so I worked at Rhubarb um, for a number of years and in 2010 I became the uh, events coordinator. They hired me as a permanent member of staff. Um, and I was, I was also invited to work at PhotoFest in 2010. So I went there for a month in Houston. It's absolutely crazy festival, but um, well, the festival is great, but the review is absolutely crazy. Uh, it's very intense, but it's really enjoyable. And I also was invited to work at Photo Build in Berlin, 2007, 2008 at the festivals. Um, so I really love working at festivals and I was really passionate about it and I think that came across. Uh, and I think it's really important. It's the first few years I was only volunteering at, um, at Rubar, but it's important if you are a student to think about how you can get involved in the photography community because uh, the, the um, connections and the networks that you make when you're working at these organisations is very important. Uh, and you may be the best photographer, but if you don't have any contacts and networks, then it's, it's really very difficult. Uh, so if any students are here watching, I definitely recommend volunteering at festivals, working at festivals, interning, format, or whatever. Um, then uh, after I, uh, 2012, I was made redundant, unfortunately, because uh, Rhubarb, uh, the director of Rhubarb, Rondo was not very well. so. Uh, Rubarb wasn't considered financially um, stable by the Arts Council, so we lost Arts Council funding and then I, I, I was very redundant, so I left. And um, then I applied for a job at Format Festival with Louise and I had a really, really bad interview because I'm worse at interviews than I am at public speaking. And uh, but Louise is as brilliant as she is. She asked me to be the portfolio review coordinator instead, so which I was really excited about. And, I did that for a number of years and well after 11 months she asked me if I'd also be the if I'd become the format coordinator and I said yes of course definitely so I started doing that for a few years um so yeah I did a lot of really wonderful projects at format 
Uh, you might recognise some of these quad on the left, former headquarters. Louisa just sitting there in the office. Um, St. Warburg's Chapel and some other ones. Uh, this is one of the projects I did. One of the highlights of working that format was the uh, Donggang Festival uh, in South Korea. So me and Louise went there, and you see a couple of the artists there Tom Hunter and Lottie Davis, and Julia Fullerton Batten also went around the in this image. Uh, but it was a really great exhibition. Uh, I'm sure Louise would agree it's, the South Koreans are very, very efficient. Uh, it was a really brilliant, brilliant exhibition in time in Yongwol and um, in Seoul as well. Um, on the right, there's an exhibition in Beijing. It's one of the last projects I did when I was working at Format. That was slightly different to the one in South Korea, but it's still a great exhibition nevertheless. Um, in the middle there is another one of the portfolio reviews I did at Unseen Photo Fair a few years ago. Um, I initiated that and I really, it's one of my, also my, one of my proudest achievements working at Format to do a review at Unseen is really brilliant. I also did a review at Street Level Photo Works with the brilliant Malcolm Dixon a few years ago. So we've done reviews at various different places and uh, I mean, like Louise mentioned last month, we did a first online portfolio review, which is uh, really intense, but really brilliant. Um, thanks to Neve for all the hard work on that. She worked really hard on the picture and Zoom and I wouldn't have been able to do it, do it without her. So thank you. Um, you have some other projects and things that I've worked on as well. The top one is Flana, it's a two year project I did with a, a Procure Art in Portugal. That was in Spain, and the bottom image shows me and Louise reviewing portfolios in Hamburg, the Hamburg Triennial, uh, I think 2015. That's more images from Unseen. Um, on the right there, you'll see somebody reviewing um, Eva Gravayat. She's a good friend of mine. She was, a, she was an intern at Rhubarb Rhubarb in 2007, I believe, and um, we kept in touch over the years and worked on different projects together. She invited me to go work at uh, Castle Photo Book Festival, which I did in 2015. And the same year, I also worked at Photo Festival in Łódź in Poland. So Louise was kind of happy enough for me to go and do different things because I, I really liked working at different festivals and places. Um, and uh, Eva and myself, we work on a number of other projects. So it's another thing I was saying about networking. Something may not happen straight away, but it will. Um, so by this, this is 2017, I'd worked at Format for five years and I really kind of wanted to um, a change in my life. Louise was on return to leave and I was kind of working in format and format 17 was quite it was quite stressful because Louise was not there and I was undergoing a lot of pressure at home, my own personal life, um, which kind of led to me wanting to leave my job and leave Derby and leave format and quad and leave Birmingham as well. So um, I got a job in Manchester at Curated Place and I worked there for 11 months. Um, as the job was supposed to carry on, but because we lost, we also lost a big project. Uh, the job was cut short and it was 11, only an 11 month contract. I really enjoyed being there, working there with the team and uh, we did a lot of interesting events. Uh, Spectra Light Festival, Music Festival in Aberdeen. Uh, I organized a conference for that and uh, one of the key speakers was Eliza Reed, a really brilliant writer. Um, and she's also the first lady of Iceland. So it was really interesting. Um, Creative place have a lot of uh, roots in Nordic uh, Scandinavian countries. It's a really great organization. Um, so I worked there for 11 months and then I, I left and I started applying for jobs in other places and I, I couldn't really find anything. And I thought, well, I've been working in this industry for so long now and I, I feel like I have enough experience. So I decided to go freelance. I've always wanted to make the jump, but I never did. But I decided to make the jump, so I became freelance. And I kind of was looking, I messaged some people that I know in the industry. One of them was uh, David Drake from Photo Gallery. And um, he also runs, is a director of Diffusion Festival in Cardiff. Um, and I've, I've worked with Alina Casina, as um, Louise mentioned, and uh, her work should in the vision fit really, but fit the theme sound the vision very well. So I uh, spoke to David and I said, it's really, really, really great for the festival. What do you think? And he said, yes, definitely. He spoke to Alina and he liked the work. So I curated an exhibition there at um, Diffusion last year, which I'm really, I'm really proud of as well because I've worked with Alina for a, couple, for a good few years now on different various projects. And I really like her work and she's such a great artist and good to work with. Her Children of Vision project now has expanded and she um, invites young people to send in their images and um, she curates them and shares them on the platform. So it's really, really brilliant. 
And then I also started working um, with David on The Place I Call Home as a creative producer. Uh, the Place I Call Home is a, an international British Council funded project that connects the UK to the six Gulf states. Uh, so we had um, 10 exhibitions happening, uh, six, there were six Gulf states and then four around the UK. Happened between September last year and March this year. So it's, uh, you can imagine logis logistically is quite a, I wouldn't say nightmare, but it was uh, challenging, <laughs> definitely challenging, especially working in countries that you're not aware of and the processes and things, and it's, it's very different from working here. But it was a really great experience, and I'm really grateful for David for offering me this. And um, the first exhibition we had was in Derby in September, uh, in um, with format and quad. Uh, so that image above is uh, at River Lights in Derby, and the image below on the right is uh, in Doha in Qatar. Uh, so I met a lot of really great artists that I'd still keep in touch with, and well, that's actually my dad. And then the, the top image and the top image, in the back is my dad. Uh, mom and dad came to this event for the first time. They don't, they don't really go to my events. My dad does. My mom doesn't so much, and she really enjoyed seeing the work, and uh, especially she could relate to the the themes. There's a lot of um, they all in Muslim countries. A lot of the Muslim countries, so was, you know, uh, themes that she could relate to. It's Islam, basically, and. Um, Arab culture and um, so I worked in a lot of different countries. The Gulf is not on there, but um, Neve's kindly offered to colour this in for me later, so she's going to do that. Thank you, Neve. Um, so actually, I get a I still suffer from imposter syndrome, uh, as I'm sure many people do. But um, me and my ex colleague Michael Sargent, who uh, used to work at Quad and Format with me, is a great format team. He Often we often just we used to we used to compete about who who suffered it more really. But I mean he works at Magnum now, so um, but I mean I'm still doing great as well. But uh, I look at this map and I think, well, how could I work at all these places if I really am that bad at working? I can't be that bad, right? So um, I I kind of look at this to remind me that I'm, I'm not that bad, and I realise I'm going over my time, so I'm just going to move on. Uh, so since I've been that that fin place I call home finished in March, and um, the lovely Sean Bunnell in um, based in Manchester, asked me to uh, work on this project with her, Trace Portfolio Review. Oh no, sorry, I'm getting confused. I'm, sorry, it's a Trace um, COVID-19 Portfolio. We had a print sale. Uh, there was 70 odd photographers and 18 images. And we raised over 40,000 pounds, I believe, for crisis and um, refuge. So it was a really brilliant initiative that Sean initiated with um, Tracy Marshall. And um, there's some really brilliant photographers involved. Um, so that's one of the projects I've been working on since the lockdown. Um, another thing I've done is I've worked with Josh Adam Jones, who's a photographer uh, who's in the place I call home. He just graduated from an MA course at uh, UWE, University of West England, in Bristol. And he interviewed me about reframed and um, diversity and lack of diversity in the arts. So it's a really great article. Um, I, I don't really read, I don't really write articles. I'm not really very vocal about my thoughts before, but I'm becoming more vocal about um, standing up for, you know, against racism and standing and just, just being more vocal about, like this is um, <laughs> a quote there, for example. Um, I just think that we, we should all kind of we'll have a, it's our responsibility to stand up and speak against anything that is wrong and um, something that I'm going to try and do more and more now and uh, I think it's one of the reasons that Louise has invited us on here so she knows how important Reframed is in this time. Um, so check that out if you can and the, all the MA work is really brilliant as well. Uh, this is a project that Louise brief, briefly mentioned, Tape Letters, a really brilliant project that I'm working on. Um, uh, so the it's an oral history project um, connecting people, so the people that uh, migrated to the UK uh, from Pakistan in between the 60s and 80s, uh, a lot of them were from um, around the Midbury from Kashmir, where, where is that, which is where I originate from, and our language Batwari is not written language. Um, so people used to often communicate via tape, so they'd send a message on tape, send it back and forth, which is quite an interesting um, thing to do, and um, Sorry, I thought I got a message here to say, be quick. Um, but yeah, Tape Letters is a really brilliant project and we basically are 
trying to collect some tapes um, to put into an archive, ar archive at Bridge Bishopsgate Institute in London. We also interview people about the experiences of migration and remembering using cassette tapes uh, because there's a there's a lack of South Asian history in libraries and archives and uh, when I was young and I went to museums I didn't see myself there at all so this is part of our history that we're trying to record and share um, and it kind of brings me on to Reframed uh, so Reframed is you know a really brilliant network we'll talk more about that in a minute but um, the reason one of the reasons that I'm really interested in was really interested in and and approached me was um, last year um, was the lack of support for emerging artists from uh, you know, black Asian other people of ethnic, other ethnic minorities um, lack of support there is they receive um, is, is out there and that's kind of one of the reasons and also working within our communities to make culture more accessible um, so that's kind of why I've um, why I'm part of Reframed and also it's really brilliant to work with. Andrew Jagdish and Anand because they're really brilliant artists and I'm, I'm, I'm not an artist myself I'm just a curator and I shouldn't say just I'm a, cura I'm a curator and producer I do really exciting things but uh, making art is not one of them uh, the, the other projects I'm involved in the photo exhibition archive which is run by Eva Gravayat my good friend and uh, it's basically an archive of um, exhibitions so we go to an exhibition if you like the layout of it then we document it and put it onto this archive uh, you'll find the website, it's just the photo exhibition archive.com. The format portfolio review is ongoing, you know, it's really great. Um, it's a really great event that I do every year that I really love doing because it keeps me connected to format. Um, I'm also on the format, uh, I'm also on the boards of Red Eye Photography Network, Format Festival, and 1623 Theatre Company, all really great organizations. Um, if anybody else wants me to be on the board, make sure you have a logo that's in the some sort of shade of red. That would be great, thank you. So don't ruin that um, line up there. Um, thank you very much for listening to me waffle on. My mum is calling me, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> um, she probably asked me if I want tea. Um, so I want to thank you very much. Uh, if I have any questions, uh, Debbie, or should I? Yeah, you do. So just a quick question. Um, someone's asking, um, what did you study? university prior to leaving and what made you leave university? I studied photography at University of Wolverhampton and um, there were like three lecturers for all three years and it just wasn't very, it wasn't very well organised and um, also I'm not very really academic, I'm very more practical, I, I didn't really like studying but, um, but I do wish that, if, if, sometimes I do wish that I'd gone back and studied and finished my course, maybe I'd be more um, articulate and better at certain things but um, it is what it is and uh, it's right for some people, it's not right for others, but um, the, you know, the, the course was not great and I, I don't know what it's like now, but at the time it was really terrible. Well, you've managed to get so many things done with your career, Seb. I think if you'd have gone to university, um, you'd have, would have missed lots of amazing projects that you've done. You've um, made so many things happen. That's true. I'm very privileged. It's been <laughs> lovely hearing you talk. I shall disappear again and come back any further, further questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry. One more. Yeah. So one more's come through for you. Um, someone said, brilliant talk, Seb. Your experience speaks volumes. How do you and the someone team... Know, right? <laughs> Sorry? It's probably some, from someone that I know. Yes, your talk's been very good. It's been really good, interesting to hear you talk. Um, how do you and the team at Reframed envision the project? I know um, our Nan's going to talk about this further as well. But they're asking, yes. yes. How, how do you envision the project at Reframed? Well, Reframed is a really big organisation that we put together and um, um, there's, there's, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for now. There's, there's so many different aspects of, you know, the frame that with so many different um, angles and things that we can do and take and it, it really kind of depends on how much, what, right now the COVID-19 project is, you know, we've selected five best three award winners and we're working with a group of people to run some workshops. So we're just kind of, it's very, it's very new and uh, we, will ho we hope to have a network of people who are BAME, who are BAME, <laughs> uh, who want to work with us and want support and need support and we're all about supporting emerging artists and working with communities. So that's kind of the road that we want to take and that's how it will be. But I'm, not, I'm not sure what that will look like in a few years, but we're really all very passionate about working with the community and working with the artists. So uh, hopefully it'll be really exciting and we can work with organisations like Format and other, you know, 
uh, certain people and places and it'll be really great. Brilliant. Um, so we've got Jasper from Bura just uh, shouting up for Wolves University that apparently has got a lot better. Um, and she's a, a, they're a visiting lecturer at um, there now. And so it's a good place. So good to hear that. Um, people really enjoyed your talk. I'm going to move on because we're getting a bit behind on time. But Joe Coates has said it's been a brilliant talk from both of you so far. Um, you both have so much going on, done so much. How do you keep motivated towards social justice while being so busy? Um, and any tips on managing projects whilst maintaining sanity? It's very hard. I don't know how I'm still saying actually. Andrew, do you want to answer that? Well, <laughs> I guess I keep uh, motivated because the world keeps being a terrible place at times. So lots of uh, reference to your work about. That's a very good and yet depressing point. Um, I'm going to hand back over because we're, we're getting a bit behind on time. I shall come back in later if we have more questions. Thank you, Debbie. So it's moving on to <coughs> Jack now, uh, who's a practice-based, uh, not as practice and research-based, artist and curator, really brilliant, co-founder, co-director of Famed. Jack, dish over to you. Thank you. Um, we've worked together for nearly, for, we've known each other for a year nearly doing this and it's the first time I've really listened to anyone, any of you talk about your lives. I'm going to keep this theme going of uh, working class black youth in the Midlands making our way in the art world. Uh, I'm going to sh try and share 10 years of, 25 years of what I've been doing in 10 minutes. Let me find this. So it's been quite rushed, I think. So I, I um, after leaving university, I s s went to work in uh, the homeless sector in London. And I, came, I lived near the South Bank and I came across a Don McCullen exhibition at the South Bank where he took pictures of home. some part of the exhibition is, is his work on the, with homeless people. And I was working with the same characters that he knew and I knew all these, I could walk through central London, I would not have actually be a homeless person. And I took some pictures but I never actually, uh, I've never, did, this is the first time I've shown them, I've never I've always felt it was a bit wrong to exploit people, or it's felt a bit exploitative. And I think there is something about the background you come from where you have a, you feel there's a sense of responsibility in how you view other people. Because if, I don't know why, but that we had, there was something that was about that that always stayed with me uh, when I was taking the pictures. After I worked with the homeless people for about 10 years, but after that I went to work in a, in a human rights field doing anti-racist campaigning. We worked on a number of large famous campaigns like the Stephen Lawrence campaign. This is one of the pictures on our website, which is uh, Janet Alder, whose brother Christopher Alder died in Hull Police Station in April 1998, uh, which is a tragic tale in itself. But the, when you're working in that field, there's the, the, it's almost surreal in, the, in how you hear these people's stories. Uh, we campaigned to get justice for her brother. A few years later, uh, Hull City Council had to admit to Janet that they'd given her the wrong body to bury and Christopher was still in the mortuary. There was only one black man in the mortuary in Hull at the time, so I don't know how that mistake was made. But the, there is something about working in the human rights field where uh, the tales are so surreal that actually I, for, for almost 20 years I never really watched television because the real world is almost more bizarre than the fictional world you see on television. This was Janet in the, in the 90s. Uh, this is another case we worked on is Ricky Real, who died after a race attack in Kingston. Uh, her family that were found out there under police surveillance for um, almost 10 years, uh, which is quite common in a way. This is uh, Ricky Real's family. I've been going through some of these old stories from the past because we're doing an exhibition next year in London, looking at 102 years of race murders, um, the first sort of recorded race murders in 1919. But we're sort of looking through the history of Britain through these uh, a collection of different uh, stories. Um, and I think it's the, we, one of the things that we are aware of it we framed is that is the relationship between I mean people aren't really openly racist that much now I mean I know it happens a lot but, but it's a lot more the English racism is a lot more subtle and it uh, happens through images 
as much, much as uh, through people's imagination. And the reason why we see so much disparity in sort of criminal justice outcomes on, on race and why things like when people talk about joint enterprise and gangs, it's always talking about black or working class gangs, it's never talking about MPs or bankers or other things, is because of the way that the popular culture and that cultural imagery works. And I think we part of what we talk about is how we can challenge uh, that legacy, uh, which has been a legacy since the beginning of photography. Um, the converse of that, this image is also uh, make people aware of situations that might that might not. So this is a some, this is a photograph that was in the Independent in two thousand and eight, and it's, it's two Roma children who drowned in the sea while everyone's still having their holidays around them. I mean, we were so shocked by this because at the time when the Roma community across Europe were under attack, the Roma community are European, but they were being kicked out of Europe as well at the same time. We, we started a project with them. Um, we started a campaign with the Jap Derbyshire Gypsy Liaison Group, which is the, the largest Gypsy Liaison Group in the country. And uh, that sort of campaign against the Italian Embassy resulted in a little project to document gypsy lives across Derbyshire, where we helped the local communities uh, photograph themselves in the way that wanted, and they uses they used their own uh, images from their own archives, and we put together an exhibition from that at the New Art Exchange. This is a few images from the exhibition. So the the the, the time lag between that imperial image period and the independent to the exhibition is like three or four years, so it's quite a long gap. And we we uh, they wanted to publish a book, so we took all of their photographs, put them on palm board, and we took the farm boards around different camps across Derbyshire and Lincolnshire. And from that, they edited a book themselves in some of the caravans. Um, I think I was the first, certainly Asian man, allowed to sit in the caravans with the gypsy women, because most of the project were women. And that, because, and one of the things that the, a lot of the younger people wanted to do is visit London, because they'd never been to London. So we arranged to launch the book at the Houses of Parliament. And I think one of the things that we, part of what I try to do is think about not, not photography as just in that moment when you press the shutter, but there's that longer process between how you start working with people to how you end working with people and where you leave them from that process. And it's, and it's one of the problems when you get commission work, because often you get commission work where you're told, given a brief and go off, do something in 10 weeks. But a lot of the stuff I do myself takes three or four years because that's, I see it as a longer piece of work to try and empower a community and think about themselves and think about language and images and all that type of stuff. So this this resulted in uh, in them visiting the House of Commons and giving talks. Um, my one of the first commissions I got, which is where I met Anand, uh, I think about four years ago, was, was from Black Country. Um, working on a project about Desi pubs, which, um, and the way I approached that project was to, I spent ages sitting in the pub talking to landowners and the punters, and uh, we're trying to get a sense of what the pubs mean to them. And as this for this character, the, it was a sense of achievement. He'd, he'd taken over a pub in a rundown area and converted it into a big, massive community hub. And we sort of tried to capture what that meant for him. And uh, a lot of the Sikh community have this image of uh, the lip sing. I don't know if people actually should have shown that image. There's an image of a of a Indian Punjabi uh, king sitting on a horse, uh, which and so he wanted to recreate that image. That image was created by Queen Victoria uh, in what she imagined an Indian prince would look like. So it's actually an English imagination of a Punjabi, but. It, and it's, it's the way the image is uh, converted into different communities. So we sort of recreated this image in a pub in the black country. And I think it's an important part of the story is, is, is the way that the pubs have become, uh, in the 70s, these were hubs where would be overrun by racists, but now they're, oh, they're, they're safe places where local women and children and families come together. And I think it's, 
with it's a sense of community that the, the people are bringing to them so we sort of i have this way of working in photography where, where we have a more of a collaborative approach to the image making and it's almost you know it's almost like a performative in what in how i try to cajole people into thinking about how they want to present themselves and it is that interrelationship between um me as a photographer and them as subjects and there's a lot more collaborative way in, in trying to create things together i think that we are trying to do in my work that maybe some people don't um one of the recent projects was about um the second world war and muslim soldiers which started off as a, as a discussion in a in a pakistani community center in nottingham about prevent and the lack of uh, and how young people find it difficult to talk about politics openly because if you're critical of the state you could be uh, referred to the prevent unit and it was a way of us thinking about the past uh, one of the issues that a lot of the indian soldiers face and the same with the african soldiers is you're you're fighting for a, a british empire as much as trying to undermine a british empire and you have these twin things going on in your head which is a bit similar to what young people face now in a way where you're it's not you're, you're not trying to overthrow a state but you're, you're trying to think of how to make things better for your own community so we were trying we use the story of the soldiers to think about uh issues in current life in a way and we used uh if on the left this is how we presented the work so there's this there's a sort of a a sort of more war memorial type feel about the place but but if you look at the images on the left hand side it's a mixture of archival images and a mixture of archival letters from the state um, talking about how uh, for example they want to keep put people under surveillance or talking about how islamophobia has been spread by the state and it's a way of trying to get people to to think and and look more closely at the details of, of what's going on and in, in what we're trying to do and uh, open up a discussion of what's what sort of the similarities between the past and the present one of the things i quite like using I, for there isn't that many community centers across the midlands now uh, that are sort of secular and open to all communities and art centers i don't think now have an important role in society so one of the things i try and do in, in the work is rethink what the space could be for the community and for this exhibition. In some exhibitions in the past, I've used the gallery space to host meals where the peoples on the wall would be talking amongst, the, would be fed by the community. I couldn't do that in the art exchange. But we did want to bring up the issue of food poverty and, and the fact that in during the war, the million uh, people from Ingle died from starvation and we, we try to think about how the state thinks about food as supply and we hosted a meal in a community center next door to the art exchange which is a sort of collaboration between the muslim and jewish community in nottingham so i try and bring um the the stories of archives and history and art into the community and bring it into sort of present day it's part of the process so I'm, i think about photographers are much larger piece of work than just the image in a way it's not that it's all about how the image fits into the present world in a way as well this is a just a couple of pictures from an exhibition that we took down yesterday in leicester based on asian football teams the whole world of community grassroots football that goes on um in leicester there's i think there's thirty thousand people involved in grassroots football week in week out which is amazing it's an amazing way of uh, of young men particularly but in the 70s but a lot of uh, young women girls now as well um taking part in a sort of communal activities and i think the, the there isn't as there isn't as much football imagery out there as there should be actually there isn't that many interesting football projects and i think actually football is is a is a huge cultural activity that's really worth investigating so I do a range of different work, which is all about um, uh, communities, archives, history, and I've tried to think about how photography is much wider in, in, than image making in itself. I, we've set up something called um, the Nottingham Centre of Photography in Nottingham with the photo parlour, 
which is the only community dark room in East Midlands, I think. Um, and we host monthly get-togethers, or we did host monthly get-togethers when before COVID. And we have a, and we've had an annual festival for two years in Nottingham, uh, where we show work for, from about 100 different photographers locally in about 10 different venues across across Nottingham. And we have, have talks for 10 days, which is really, really popular. So we've started to develop a nice community in, in Nottingham uh, around that. One of the things we try and do is bring in people from different communities into the into the, uh, the work photography world. And this is a piece of work I've been doing in um, in Nottingham with mental health users um, for the last 10, 12 weeks. And every week we, we, uh, they come, I give them sort of challenges where they go away, take pictures. So this is some of the work where they're talking about anxiety uh, under COVID. And I'm going to go off to university next year. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is that relationship between archives, social engagement, and, and art and photography, especially in the Midlands. So his, his two images from someone called John Reardon, who set up, was part of the Handsworth Community Photography Project, where, which I'm sure most people know the work, which is, was sort of self-portraiture. Um, the other side of the work is, that he was involved in was uh, commercial photography, and this is the, the famous picture of, of, a, of a black bomber during the Handsworth riots, which is displayed all over Handsworth. And it's this thing where there's a tale of community arts, which is quite white. And um, when we read about community arts, and when we talk about community uh, art photography, the, the whole history of the black art movement in the Midlands or the black art centers in the Midlands is almost left out as if it's not part of that world and part of that narrative. So part of what the research I was trying, trying to think about is, is about the, the bits that's missing from the art canon, and especially the photography canon. This is a, 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 something I found in uh, PhotoWorks magazine a few years ago, which is a, it's presented as the history of photography from the mid nineties to the, to the mid, and it's a list of all the exhibitions that took place and the galleries and who's involved in who. And it's, it, this is, it's an interesting, you can't really see it, but I can send it on to people if people are interested. So it goes to all the characters, how things set up, oops, where you never came from, etc. But it's, what's quite interesting about it is, if you go to most university courses now, this chart, is the the curriculum in the photography world and there's hardly any black presence in this world and i think there's a lot there is a, a, a such an urgent need to develop not just the decolonializing the camera type of course but actually rethinking what the black canon in the photography world is i think the art world has done much better on that in that respect uh, and I'm I'm sh I'm shocked still that when I talk to most photographers, they they struggle to name any black photographers, maybe Van Lee Work, but hardly anybody. And there's a whole world out there that, that's sort of that's uh, there's a whole world of local black photography that's missing. But there's a you know there's a whole world of uh, black and Asian photographers, which is a and part of the reason why we want to set up with Fame is to think about those issues. But we want to think about those issues amongst ourselves as much as with everybody else. And I think part of what we want to do is create that dialogue within ourselves. Because it's all, because part of what we're trying to do, what we would more like to do is have discussions within our own communities about what does art mean and how should things be represented amongst ourselves. And it's difficult to do if people haven't been educated in the history because the educated history doesn't exist properly. So there's a, it's a, it's a two way process that we're trying to engage in. So I'll stop there, I think. And that was brilliant. And I think some of the points you said are absolutely spot on. You know, we all need to know more about the history of black photography. I'd love to see more. Um, people are saying they'd love to see the slide. So if you can share it afterwards, that would be fantastic. Okay.
got no questions at the moment, but I'm sure lots will be coming at the end, so I'm going to disappear and hand back over. So, yep, I'm going to, sorry, I got distracted by trying to copy that slide over. I'm going to hand over to Anand, who's the last speaker today. Well, thanks, Jagadish, and thanks to Format and uh, the team for setting this up. Um, very grateful to you to having us all on, and thanks for everybody who's attended to hear, hear from us today as well. It's wonderful to see so many people coming along. So you've got the graveyard shift now <clears throat> with me on there, so <clears throat> I hope you can keep awake. So, um, yeah, I think I'll go straight into it. And just to give you a bit of direction uh, about my work, I uh, let me just share my screen. So I've got about three points that I want to go over. The first part deals with the origins of, origins of my photographic practice, how I started in photography. The second point is a look at my long-term project and personal work, Supna Dreams of Our Fathers which I also showcased at this year's Format 20, to, Format 20 to various reviewers. And then finally, I'll be looking at uh, uh, more community research archive that I set up that you heard earlier on called the APNA Heritage Archive, which really looks at readdressing the fact there were no um, historical images of the Punjabi community in my own city in Wolverhampton, which is 40,000 strong a collection that I uh, wanted to focus around the, the period of migration for the Punjabi community, 1960 to 1980. So I'll start with my first slide. <clears throat> so yeah, I think uh, what happened in 2019, I can't seem to move my screen, bear with me. Right. It's moving now. So, okay, so in 2019, I had a knee operation. And uh, while I was hobbling around recovering, I had a keyhole surgery. I knew I was going to ha have about 10 days where I'd be just be hobbling around because I had the other knee done six months prior. I decided to thumb through my old archives and I was thinking about this work that I hadn't really paid much attention to that I created in 1991. Um, which was the very first thing I did as a photographer in one sense. I did a GCSC, I started out with the GCSC in photography, I passed that. I did an A-level in photography, I passed that, but I still didn't really know what I wanted to do in photography or if I wanted to do photography at all. And as uh, luck would have it, you know, I kind of stumbled on watching an omnibus documentary on the BBC about Sebastian Salgado and... Uh, his work around work, industrial workers around the world. And I was totally mesmerized by this, of course. And the light bulb suddenly went on and I thought, that's exactly what I want to do with my photography. I want to become a photojournalist, someone who tells the truth about the situations and circumstances people find themselves in the world. So that's what I embarked on. So I didn't have a camera all through my GCSE A-level you know, I was borrowing the, the school, uh, sorry, the college cameras. And uh, I wanted to take my work further. So I wanted to do an h and in documentary photography. So the first thing I did was I bent my arm, uh, my dad's arm to, you know, I asked him to buy me this camera and he couldn't afford it, but lovingly, he was a good man, you know, a great man. And he, uh, he bought me my first camera and which was a Praktika camera in East German make and, it lasted about six months, so you soon realized that they were good for making, uh, you know, used for spares in tractor parts and then a camera soon after that. But I did this first project before it broke, which was at my mom's factory in Wolverhampton. She worked here and I asked my mom, I said, can I, you know, come to your, uh, your uh, workplace and photograph the, the people there and take some portraits? And she said, yes, you can come on one condition that you know, you don't tell anybody I'm your mother, number one, and uh, you just keep yourself to yourself and out the way kind of thing. And it was a recipe for the disaster because as soon as I walked in, they, everyone said, you know, is that your mom over there? You know, they knew straight away, kind of straight away. So um, I did a series of these. And so my photography really hails from the days of, you know, there's no phones or internets or social media about digital cameras, you know, very much hail from the days of, black and white and as a student 
Uh, black and white was very much king amongst the students. Color was a dirty word. And as far as utilizing flash went, uh, flash was something you did in the privacy of your own home. My reframe colleagues are probably cringing right now because these are all, these are all the old jokes coming out now. So basically this was the first thing I did a foray into what I perceived as reportage off my own back and it opened the door for me to go and do a H&D documentary photography. And it was interesting looking at these images because most of these I never ever printed before. There's only two or three portraits are printed. And so I kind of was thinking about them and they meant more to me now than they did before because I thought, you know, all this industry around the Punjabi workers within the area who came into the country to fill up the labor shortages labor shortages after the second world war working in factories and foundries invited by the britain british government as being part of the commonwealth along with west indian and pakistani workers in the region i thought well this doesn't exist anymore and this is a very very important document now so with the living memory project in 2019 uh, Jeff Broadway, who works with the Living Memory Project, is another archival project that exists within the Mid Midlands. He asked me if I would like to be commissioned to do some work. And I thought, well, I would like to do something new around the Punjabi workers. So I wanted to do some more portraits and archive collections and gathering the thoughts of individuals who had worked in the community, because I thought that would be a good, you know, kind of research element to look at uh, within the confines of the project and the small commission. So this gentleman on the left here, he used to work at the Goodyear factory. He's in his old overalls. And uh, on the right hand side is a picture where he was working in the factory. The, he's standing in the spot now where the factory has been knocked down. It's become a housing estate. They're building houses on the, on the place, but he's standing very close to the spot where he used to work. And that in the background, that's the only thing that they haven't been able to take down, which is the old clock tower associated with the Goodyear factory. So I'm looking at all kinds of people who work in the area, just researching, knocking on doors, trying to find various people within day groups who've got interesting photos and stories around their images of working around the black country. The whole project unfortunately stopped at the exhibition stage because of COVID. It was due to be exhibited uh, at Dudley Archives. I also worked alongside with Dudley College students to work in a similar way, looking at their own families and describing historical images and recording stories from their own families, but it all got stopped. So this, this project only exists in its current book form with a living memory project. So I'm also ex exploring photographing the ephemera. This is a Nermal's uh, you know, a face mask that he uses protection from we uh, welding. And he obviously on the right hand side of his pictures, archival picture, he also was uh, asked to go into Nigeria to be able to train more people uh, in welding across the world, which he's very proud of as well. So that's the kind of work that's foray into, you know, people's identity, people's livelihoods within the uh, black country. The un untold stories is what I tend to focus on. So this is the next project now. Uh, Supna Dreams of Our Fathers, like I said, showcased it at uh, Format, format 20 to various reviewers. This work is very much an intimate project about my family story, specifically my mother and father who came here in the 1960s, 70s. And um, it initially, I started looking through their albums and it, it, it's called Supna Dreams of Our Fathers. And it kind of, I want to tell the story of their dreams as well as the social, political, cultural history amongst other things and the people connected to them and their time to describe the tension of those formative years right until the present day of what it means to move to a, another place, another country. So this is a family, our family album. You can see it's like got, a, got a dream like image on there. Um, so the whole project is, is certain, on, you know, created around their dreams. Uh, this is the archival image. These images exist in our family, you know, in our family house, in our room ever have done since I was born. And uh, my, both my parents have passed away now, but it was important to show what they looked like back uh, when they first arrived. So this is what they looked like in 1967, uh, 68 when they arrived. And people forget, it's important because people forget what other people look like when they first arrived into the country. Um, so I'm doing a lot of image manipulation to communicate 
the story of my parents. So the passport images were taken. My dad arrived in 1968. He went, in, went back to India in 1969 to get engaged. And my mom came in the spring of 1970. So I fused this color of the, what's called the holy colors because she arrived in the spring of 70. Holy is the Indian festival that happens in the springtime of every year and the celebration to usher in the spring and a new season with the colors and the powder, just in case you don't know, I think most people know this, but we throw powder at each other in celebration, color each other with this, with this uh, uh, material. So this image here opens up, uh, this is uh, my street where I lived. I took it at night time because that poster there shows a picture of an interracial couple advertising a film back a few years ago which I thought was really interesting because uh, 30 years ago at the time my parents would have arrived, this, this picture like this would have caused a riot, both in the Punjabi community, who was the predominant community, caused a kind of sense of white flight, if you like, or the white people moved out, and uh, it was predominantly a Punjabi area, would have caused a, a tumult within both sections of the community. But it shows how things have slightly moved on since there as well, since that time. So the pro project sits on four categories within um, the project. So I look at portraits and it's taken me a while to, to shape this up. So the ingredients I have in the, in the project are portraits, conceptual images like this one, and I'll explain in a minute what it's about, that laden with meaning, uh, although not instantly recognizable, they're nonetheless laden with a huge amount of meaning about uh, my parents and their story. And then I'm also photographing ephemera in controlled lighting and looking at a historical collection of images for both from family archives and other archives that describe their time. So this picture was taken about five years ago, sorry, four years ago, October 2016. In the Sub-Sahara, you probably remember this, if you lived in the UK, it blew up a tropical storm. And this was taken at midday at 12 o'clock and everything seems to be pretty dark and the sun was blood red. And there was a lot of this going on at the time. And I live amongst a community that's very esoteric in their beliefs, you know, based on spiritualism, superstition, religion, you know, and it forms an intuition and it forms their basis of their everyday decisions. So I thought it was kind of interesting that in 2015, 2016, there was a tetrad of what they call blood moons and religious societies and other people were talking about the Mayan society, et cetera, et cetera. And they were talking about how this would be a harbinger of, of doom. And I looked back, the last time that they appeared was the time my dad arrived from India, 1967. There was a tetrad. It's an unusual event. Uh, it, uh, it happened in 20, uh, sorry, 1965 to 1966 in uh, both the spring and the autumn, equinox or whatever it might be, uh, four times in a row. And it, the last time that happened was 400 years previous to that. So both times are marked because I'm trying to connect about what's going on today and the time my parents arrived in the city of Wolverhampton at that time because both times you've seen these signs appear is followed by some kind of tumult upon the earth if you like protests around mass migration uh, populist governments are rising up and certainly this figure on the right here of well probably yeah, right of your screen here is Enoch Powell and he was the infamous MP for Wolverhampton who made a very popular speech uh, or very famous speech, I should say, not a popular one by any means, but he made an infamous speech uh, in Birmingham. He called the media to attention. He said, I'm gonna make a speech, it's gonna go up like a rocket. Whereas all the other rockets come down, this one's staying up. And he becomes a bastion for the people who are just uh, opposing immigration and uh, that's what he's standing up for. He's, he's kind of a very fascinating character in the history of migration and my dad used to talk a lot about him um, when I was growing up and lived very care carefully which I could never understand. He had a suitcase ready packed just in case he thought we would be shipped back to, to India because of what was going on at the time. So I'm trying to create these metaphors for Enoch Powell because my research shows that when he talked to people who lived, he lived quite close to me, but when he talked to other Asian people, they say when you appeared, you know, approached Enoch Powell, he was a gentleman. 
But on the podium, he was a totally different character. He was ready to devour you. So I took this image of a tiger in Dudley's zoo. It was taken in the day. I manipulated it. And like when you see a close, a tiger quite, quite close up, he's got that look of hunger and, um, you know, predatory, predatory eyes, if you like. And I wanted to accentuate this as a metaphor for what Enoch Powell is. He's almost like the Shere Khan figure from Jungle Book. You know, he's, you don't dare not trust him or get too close to him. He might devour you at any moment. And you see this in this protest by a majority of Asian people and this young black uh, uh, lad who's joined them in protesting uh, the speech that he's given at that time, the Rivers of Blood speech. And by the way, don't worry about um, the licensing on these images. I have got permissions and I've bought the licensing to use these. So although you see these black and white images here, I will be manipulating them further. Um, and I've got permissions to do that, to, to, to really kind of vocalize the images and what they stand for. So again, this picture uh, is a picture which I've colored the river in red. It's a river that flows from Birmingham where Enoch made his speech. And it's a metaphor for when he makes a speech into Wolverhampton, he sends a shudder down the spine of migrant communities, especially uh, my father who lived quite, who worked quite close to where this picture was taken. So this picture is the Wensbury arm of the River Tame, the only river that flows from Birmingham to Wolverhampton. And I've covered, covered, colored it in red to, you know, to build that kind of um, offensive speech that, and what it meant to the community at the time. So the other thing I'm exploring, I'll try and speed up as much as I can, is the dreams uh, that are associated with my father. You know, there was more to him than just a migrant worker, factory fodder to the foundries and factories of the black country. You know, I know him and his story is indelibly etched in my brain. So it, this whole project is driving me to tell his story, mm -hmm. my mom's story, my parents' story. And uh, I've drawn this kind of astronaut's head because he was so um, mesmerized and had an obsession around space. And you know, the picture itself is one of my favorite because first of all, it's the way he's looking, his trajectory is upward looking, which is what, what my father was. He was the only member of his family to leave India and go to another distant land, he was brave enough. The others were quite well to do, so they had no reason for moving. He was more adventurous, you know. He wanted to explore the space and go on missions and ex excavate minerals and stuff out of other planets. We used to laugh at him, but it's funny how China's doing that in, 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 on the moon right now. So I've drawn this astronaut's helmet on him because he's got this signature, 3268, a year before the moon landing. And I remember him telling me he took a day off to, of work just to focus on the television, this historic event which he was totally mesmer mesmerized about. And he was very ambitious because he used to sit us down as young people and he used to say to my brother, you know, you are going to be the politician and M uh, prime minister of the country. And he used to look at me because you're going to be an astronaut and you're going to, you know, uh, discover new things and new worlds and take minerals out of the planets and bring them back here and, you know, gold, silver, all this sort of stuff. And uh, we used to laugh at him, man. But he was, he was lovely in the sense of his ideals and ambitions. He was very forward thinking and positive and uh, very supportive of my art form as well, which is not under the norm in the Indian community. So I've juxtaposed his workers' hands here. He's polishing the Spanish at work and juxtaposed it within a, um, a, a, an image of the stars, because that's his ideal is to work hard for his children, to send them up above there in the stars. Indians in space, that's for one of another better word uh, or title. So this is me as a 10 year old kid uh, standing in front of the chart that my dad put up, space chart in the background, a map of India. And he was so enthralled about this thing that I bought home from an art class one day, which was a space station. I decided to do it. I don't know whether consciously or unconsciously I did it because of the influence of my father, but I, I did this space station, just created it in art class. The teacher sprayed, painted it, I bought it home and he bought his camera out to say, okay, he said, you've got it now, my thinking's, kind of moving into your psyche. This boy is going to go into space kind of thing. So I'm also photographing the actual space chart that we've still got at home. And um, also in 2018, when I went to India uh, for another reason, I picked up the image on your left, which is a, a, a model of a satellite uh, launcher that India launches. And as 60 countries altogether have launched it, 
I was thinking about my dad thinking he would have been he would have loved the fact that India have moved on into the space race and developed and I don't think there was much going on at the time he was around so and uh, and this is my brother on the right you know holding it up you know in remembrance of my father kind of thing uh, as a homage to him uh, and a portrait to him so finally I'll move on uh, with time as quick as I can to uh, the Apna Heritage Archive the third and final point of this uh, 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 presentation so uh, this project, like I said, it was about my Punjabi migration to Wolverhampton, a photograph journey 1960 to 1989, we collect the images from that time. And what I found out was uh, after we did a pilot project, which was a small G4A from the Arts Council, a project called Exodus, Exodus Movement of Our People, we had this double page put in the Express and Star, and over 9,000 people came to a very small exhibition. So we thought, well, there's mileage here. We did a bit more research and found there was not a single image recorded anywhere, especially in Wolverhampton, where you have an image bank of 30,000 historical images. There was not one single image recorded about the Punjabi community. And we have the biggest Punjabi community outside of the London in the UK. So 15% of the whole city, 40,000 Punjabis, but not one photographic visual record about the community. So we teamed up with some of the people here the, the, the Gudwara, um, I'll tell you a bit more about the involvement there, this primary school to teach the next generation uh, of uh, kids about the project and the city archives where we could give handover images that we'd collected, historical images. They were also involved in our steering group meetings and the school project. The University of Wolverhampton were a project partner, but they weren't that involved during the two years or were directly afterwards and art, the Art Gallery in Wolverhampton, where we exhibited all the findings of the research. So we set up a dedicated archive space in the Gurdwara. They were very good to us to let us have a space for free. Um, and so we started uh, uh, moving all our stuff in there with computers, scanners, scan our work where volunteers could learn about it. But the key thing about this place was that it was in the most densely populated area of Punjabis in the city of Wolverhampton. So we wanted to attract a, a center there where we could you know, use it as a, an outreach and bring people in. But it was a hard slog for us because uh, this is the first time we've done anything on this uh, level before as an organization. Uh, we had all the right stuff going for us, but to actually get those images, you see, you see all these images being handed out to us now, some of them were our own. And as you see a lot of people in, the, in that space, but it took us about a good 11 months to understand that you cannot approach the community and tell them that they're going to archive their history or et cetera, et cetera. It's an important project. They just don't get it. So the approach we found out that would work was to say to them, uncle, auntie, do you came here with three pence in your pocket. Do you want people to forget what you did and achieved where you are now? And they were like, no, no, what's going on? You know, and the, the, they, all the albums started um, uh, coming out then and we would scan them. We'll give them all a file reference name, the who, what, where, when, the people, where the picture was taken, copyright, everything would, would be displayed on a, on a document. Today, you can see all those 2000 images that we collected on the website as well. And every time you click on an image, you will also get the information. And like I said, all those 2000 images are also held at the city archive if you hand it to them at the end of the project. The, the base, the center was also used, uh, the dedicated archive space was also used as a place to train the volunteers. You have Richard Lewis here on the right from Dudley Archives who came and supported. He wasn't originally involved in the project, but was very, very supportive and came to train our volunteers on future proving the archive. There was a schools project. So we would go into team with the city archives um, and um, you know, then they would teach the kids about the value of strong rooms, uh, how they scan 10 by eight images, why it was important to keep images, what a strong room was, all that kind of simple thing. We also did a phot photographic storytelling project with them. So they pick up photographic skills as well within the confines of the project. And so we had over 27,000 uh, people attend the exhibition. Here's just some of the images I took during that time. So we had this very, uh, you know, well curated exhibition um, uh, in there. So we had three rotating slides. Uh, for each decade, 200 images, benches where you could sit and look at the images and also follow through. We had scrolls on the walls where you could 
Each image had a file reference number, which you could trace and find out more information. If you want to research that, we had the current day portraits of um, the Punjabi community, the original ones that came along. And we had a Vitrain cases full of the, the artifacts that what things that we scanned from, uh, and also family albums, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So post the exhibition, this was the important thing we learned from it. The penny dropped in the whole of the city, I would say, in, in a lot of sense, with vast majority of Punjabis coming to see the exhibition. Schools, universities, fashion departments, historical departments started to coming and they wanted to engage more with the project because you know hearing about it is one thing, but seeing the images is another thing. So uh, fortunately it was extended the exhibition by the city council due to the popularity and we were able to bring day centers, groups, etc., schools work, etc. That's pictures in the wrong place. And you see people here on the left, top left of the corner. This lady here discovered a picture of a granddad on an iPad. So we had an iPad, so all 2000 images were accessible. We have people on the bottom right, there's a couple who just walked in and found an image that their brother had given them of their marriage day. And so it was wonderful to see how they would react and how they were entertained by it, how they were you know, so um, enthralled by it and having their images printed so large. I remember the first day I went in, this lady stood, stood there for about two hours, sitting on the bench, just looking at the images, her and her husband going to and fro from the iPad. And I said, you've been here a long time. She said, yeah, she said, she said the best thing, the best compliment I had about the whole exhibition was, she said it's become like a religious experience for her. And she even found a picture of her brother that who had died 20 years ago in the collection I represented. So also shows how close knit the community were. And again, these are images from all the various groups, school groups, independent faith groups came along. More school groups wanted to hear more about the project. Uh, top right there, University of Wolverhampton, the history department got involved in the project, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did was the final bit, I'm finishing now. Thanks for keeping up, uh, up to it. So the, the other thing that we did was to exhibit again in Britain's first ever good war in Semedic as part of another photo festival that was happening in the region. And we switched everything around, or I switched everything around in the sense of, I did the exhibition first, and uh, it, it just so that people could first of all experience and see it, feel the project. And from then on, I made a call out to seeing who would want to be interested in the project. And along with this day group, and along with the talks, there was a much, um, word by word of mouth it went through, and we had about 500. Uh, or sorry, I should say an organization to access of 500 people. And they said they will work with us uh, and they have images and we started collecting images as well uh, as part of a pilot project uh, I did with the Arts Council uh, to collect more images from outside Wolverhampton in the Black Country region. And so this is uh, one of the groups I attended stand, standing in front of the, we have a, a portrait a selfie studio, which people can then you know, send up via social media, et cetera, et cetera. So they, this group covered it all. And I think I want to end there. So that's it. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you so much, Anand. Thank you so much, everybody who's spoken so far, Andrew, Sabba, Jagdish. We could have had a fully dedicated um, photo forum to any one of our guests today and had, had the whole two hours dedicated to, to just yourself. So it's been a, a real challenge to, to fit all, all your contributions into the, the short time that we have. Um, we're running a bit short on time now, so um, obviously we want to get to look, hear a little bit more about Reframed itself. So if you can give an, an overview of um, the, the current plans of the project and your ethos and ethics around it. I've got one question, to, I've got all my questions down to one key question. So, um, um, and if you, if you um, I know you're gonna talk a little bit about the bursary winners, um, but there's a lot more information about that on your website that people can find out more. Um, yeah, so if you, if you could um, kick off with saying a little bit more about reframes and, um, and then I'll- Yeah, I won't spend too much time on what it was about. I think that was shared by you, Louise, at the beginning. So yeah. I think, you know, in terms of why it was set up, let's talk about that because, you know, living in the black country, living in the Midlands, uh, all the arts organizations, I would say, I had a little bit of a, um, uh, a, a, a mis I don't know, not a misunderstanding, but I just couldn't understand why most organizations who live in multicultural areas like Wolverhampton, Birmingham, et cetera, et cetera, you know, when you go to see their organization, um, they are majority all white. And I just find a disconnect because to me, it just seems to be common sense that if you want to reflect the communities that you live in, you must diversify your leadership. And I thought, thought that's just such a dearth, you know, within, within 
the organizations around the Midlands as a whole. So I had a bit of a light bulb moment thinking, well, you know, there's, there's a big gap here because there's not an organization photographic, certainly, that represents black and Asian community and photographers in general within the Midlands. So the, the thing, the next thing, the next step was to start getting to form a team. And obviously I had to pick up uh, and approach some very competent people. And fortunately, I like uh, Jagdish mentioned earlier, I knew him from the Desi Pops project, which, which we were both individually were working on some separate projects, but within the confines of the Desi Pops project. So I met him there. And I also asked him to be director at the other organization, just to confuse everybody, Black Country Visual Arts. And um, so I approached him and he's got this fantastic history and he's really brought this kind of understanding to me. And he's uh, along with Andrew uh, about social, political, cultural history specifically, because his whole history goes back. I think he was on the legal team with the Stephen Lawrence case and how he's moved into photography. So it was important to build competent people you heard Andrew Jackson say some things to me, which I just thought, wow, I've never even thought about these things. I met uh, Andrew on the uh, Blast Festival and we've got to know each other since and we're working on a project together now. Um, and he's always bringing things to me that I just blow my mind, you know, and there's some things that you've heard him say about, you know, the, the ethics of who takes whose picture and Jack just said something on this as well. You know, I, I take, I've never heard that. I never thought about that. I thought this is perfect. These are the, these people are starting to be the perfect people, you know, who I need to work with. So these two, I kind of approach, I think first, I may have approached, I think, Sabah before that, but obviously I knew Sabah, she said, she worked on uh, Rhubarb Rhubarb. Uh, I met her when she first arrived there. And I remember, I'm going to embarrass her, you know, she was wearing tracksuit bottoms and a t-shirt and she was just um, doing the everyday jobs around the, the place. And then the next thing I saw in a few years, was a totally different character leading a whole seminar on photographers, international photographers, and she was inviting them, calling them, and she was standing in front of the podium, which I would never expected her to do that. And that's testament, I suppose, to Rhubarb, Rhubarb and Rhonda to bringing her up in that way. But then really see her, uh, her career, you know, really um, uh, develop because of perseverance. Some questions uh, that people asked earlier, how do you manage to stay, um, uh, uh, sane through all this is the reason one of the big reasons I approached to develop a team that has shown perseverance because it's not been easy being a, a black and Asian photographer and we're starting at the very bottom of rung of the ladder and so it is with Reframe you know we've been and had discussions with others about the organization larger points of it have fallen on deaf ears so it was, it was important to get a good crucial uh, uh, team together um, who are very competent and highly skilled and brings th different things to the organization. You start off with a quorum of individuals and then you have an organization. So we got constituted earlier this year and I'm very, very glad to be working with these guys because it was evident when we came to write the proposal, which I'll go on to in a now, uh, our first proposal uh, project was the Midlands COVID-19 project, an application we put together uh, in the proposal stage, which the team really did more, far better than I could, I think. Um, uh, but we did it together. It felt good. We put it in and we were successful in our uh, bid to the Arts Council. And they awarded us around £25,000 to do this project uh, in its entirety, which also uh, helps us. Therefore, the money, the funding is important because that helps us to help others. So the bursary winners, which I'll you know, uh, ask Sabah to share in a second, um, but uh, along with that, we want as artists to develop our skills further and to share the main story around the COVID-19 for us was the disproportionate effect that the disease has had upon black and Asian communities. So we'll be interviewing other people and trying to encourage them to bring their stories and then sharing them on an online platform later on, taking portraits and, and, and building their uh, oral uh, history around the project as well. So I'm going to hand over to Sabah, who's going to talk a bit more about the bursary winners, if that's okay. Thank you, Anand. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly, briefly to go through these, because as Louise said, um, they are actually also online. Um, second. <clears throat> 
So if you look on the reframed website and also um, reframe team are doing features on the winners at the moment, aren't you, through social media and, uh, and other things. We've had a, a message from Anne McNeil saying, thank you, Anand, such an amazing archive project. Also love your dad as an astronaut <laughs> going through. Everybody does that. Really, yeah, it's an amazing photo. Uh, really super, super feedback, which we'll share, share with you all. Can you guys see my screen? You can't, can you? It says the screen sharing is paused. You've got it away. Share again. You see that? Excellent. Okay. So no reason to raise because we are very, very late now. Um, so we're, we're really grateful to everyone that replied for the bursaries. Um, we had some really, really brilliant applications and we're really sad that we couldn't award them to more people. But um, we have got five really brilliant winners. We want to thank also the Arts Council for uh, giving us money for this project. Um, it will really help us in the beginning of Reframed. Uh, we're, given two, we're giving out two awards. We've also been uh, added three because of uh, we work with some really great partners. So one of the very famed awards goes to uh, Justin Carey, really brilliant Birmingham-based uh, photographer. He's also uh, an NHS consultant. Um, the award uh, sponsored by BCU. Thank you for thank you to uh, BCU for this. Uh, it goes to Barty Palmer, Colorful and Cold Creative multi Multilingualism Awards, Languages and Colorful Award winners, Luca Yasmin, uh, also Birmingham based uh, Bangladeshi Muslim photographer. Uh, she'll be working with Colorful closely in documenting um, Hansworth, uh, Soho Road. The next winner is uh, Pritt Prit Kelsey, uh, who will be making video work, video based work. Um, all the bios are on the website, please do check them out. They're really brilliant artists. Uh, thank you for new art, thank you to New Art Exchange for uh, sponsoring this award. And the last award goes to Deanne Crooks. Uh, she's a reframe bursary award winner. So thank you to all of the everyone who um, applied, and thank you to all, and congrats to all the winners. And we look forward to working with you all and sharing your work with everyone. Cool. Thank you, Seb. <laughs> Um, yeah, and do, do look up the, the work of all of those, those super great artists and um, we're excited to see, see what they produce and uh, keep your eyes peeled and all our channels will be sharing it shortly, won't we? What's the time scale for production for those, for those works? It's at, at the end of October, November. Okay, amazing. Um, so I've, I've got my questions down to, to one. <laughs> We've run out of time almost, um, but I just wanted to just ask this um, and I just suppose just say that, um, you know, kind of reiterate that obviously talent is everywhere, but opportunity sadly is not. Although nearly all cultural spaces are technically open to everyone in practice, they may only be accessible to a select group of people who have the economic, social, or cultural capital to feel at home in them. The situation is, is, is clearly unjust and we, we do want to work together to, to make a change in that, in that scenario, but obviously it takes generations and a, a long, a, you know, a long term commitment to uh, establishing, supporting and empowering change. Um, as I understand, it's not only responsibility of the cultural sector, but also of education, community, uh, role models and more influence, um, influential aspirations to empower new generations to see arts as a career option in any shape or form, be it technicians, uh, marketing, uh, cultural leaders, directors, artists, and all, all kinds of creative opportunities that exist in the creative ecology. Um, what kind of, it's a kind of address to, to all the team and obviously whoever wants to um, chip into the answer, do, do shout out. Um, what can you see that can be done beyond your activities that, uh, of, of Reframe specifically that could support a shift change in terms of diversifying access to working within the arts for more black Asian and, and I guess generally speaking non-white people for me, I think, sorry, do you want me to answer it or anybody or any, did you want to say something? No, I think, I think one of the dearths that you see in terms of what's a lack of uh, across the board, and especially I think I talk about this whole country and everything in any, in any line of work is the, the dearth of training new people up. So you go for a job, you're either overqualified or you've got too many qualifications, etc. 
And um, if you look at somewhere, a friend, a, 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 um, well, I won't share that story, but the point is, you know, I think there needs to be more training given um, for black and Asian artists, more opportunities to train them up to be the next curators, documentary photographers, et cetera, et cetera, as a hands-on thing. I don't really see that happening in the region. I think that needs, it needs to really take a shift change because the way you deal with black and Asian artists and photographers, I think it has to be a different thing. I mean, if you ask for black and Asian photographer to apply to the Arts Council, nine times out of 10, in my personal opinion, certainly was with me, is that the whole thing bamboozles you. Uh, you really got to learn about the ecosystem of the arts. You've got to understand a lot more. So I think when people are brought up and trained uh, by organizations, by art galleries, I think that breaks some of that uh, 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 stigma that is on black and Asian communities. And I think uh, that's a, something that we're really certainly going to explore and would encourage other organizations to look into as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd reiterate that. I, I think there's, in, I think this is a, a, a change, a moment when things should change because I think it will, might get difficult, you know, but I think it's an important moment to, to acknowledge that there's five things top of my head I think you can, you can, our organisation can do. Firstly, I think you should open up your spaces because uh, a lot of the buildings are empty half the time. And I think if, if you just get people to acknowledge that the space exists for them and see that as a space that they can go into and use, then it becomes important. Some, you know, uh, one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter exists in Nottingham is because Nottingham Contemporary used to let people, or do let people use their space um, for meetings. Um, and it sort of, it became a space for dialogue and having, and then as people start entering the building and using the space for dialogue, then, then things shift in terms of how the cultural organisation is seen. There's a whole, Piece of work around de I mean, the piece of work around decolonizing arts is is better in some fields, but in photography, it's really backward. And I think there's a whole piece of work around that that needs to progress. And uh, it's a difficult time for funding, but I think it'd be good if our organisational constitution has a long-term vision on some issues. And there's, there's a tendency to see community activity as a short-term, 10-week project, and I think that just doesn't work. Um, one of the big problems are, is that the Arts Council performance indicators only acknowledges a high, or high arts or a certain type of art activity, which tends to reinforce exclusion in a way. And I think there's a re there's a need of rethinking some of those the way the Arts Council works on the on the how it views people. I think that, those sort of things, if people were consistently doing over a period of time, would, would radically shift things in a way. And there's a there's a need to some think of way how to share resources. I think there's lots of things that happen in the in 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 the arts outside established art organizations which aren't necessarily which are disconnected from cultural the local cultural economy and i think if there's a way to bring interconnect things that are already happening there's probably a bit of, much a simpler way to get things delivered in terms of sharing resources mm -hmm. i don't know top of my head yeah i mean certainly the <clears throat> the art sector can be quite self-congratulatory and uh, obviously we know there's quite a lot of positive work going on um, in the sector, but there's a huge, huge room for improvement. And with, with so many um, arts organisations making grand statements, and obviously important to have your voice heard and show solidarity and support for Black Lives Matter. But there's a lot of um, commitments being brandished around in terms of long term strategic change. You'll see what, what, how, uh, how people actually bear that out in the coming in the coming months and years to uh, yeah. into reality and how the opportunities actually land on the ground and, and support people to actually enter in, enter into the sector in a, in a really earnest way. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a huge amount of, of activity that needs to needs to change and, and collaboration with individuals, communities, and organisations such as such as yours as well to 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 direct direct the programmes, not only receive and and um, be part of. Uh, things organized by other people. So voices need to be heard and be, be um, empowered and supported in, in that situation, certainly. Um, 
we've kind of run out of time. Is there, is there anything else that you think you've missed that you'd like to like to say before we, we depart from our, our super, super Zoom participants and our, our audience on Facebook? We do just want to say thank you very much you know, to Louise, Debbie and Neve for inviting us having us on here. Thank you to everyone else who tuned in uh, to hear more about Reframed and we're sorry that it's kind of been really rushed and uh, you know, if people are interested, we can, you know, maybe do another Zoom talk in a few weeks more about Reframed and we can introduce you to the bursary winners and just talk more, have more of these conversations. But um, definitely people need to make change. Uh, organizations need to make change from the bottom to the top. And we need to see these changes happen. It can't just be, you know, tokenistic. It needs to be, if you haven't been doing these things in the past, you have to really look at why you haven't and what and what really needs to change. And uh, mindsets need to change. There definitely needs to be a big shift change. So, uh, but yeah, I just want to say that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. no, really, thank mm -hmm. you for everybody for contributing. And um, absolutely, there wasn't enough time to to go in as as deep as we would have liked to have done. But uh, we we were. This isn't the end of the story, and we'd like to. Uh, talk further and um, have part two to this discussion as well. Um, before we go, I'd like to just give a shameless plug for, for former activities as well. Um, do keep an eye out, eye out for our upcoming program. We're, we're planning to launch Format 21 on the 11th of March next year, all being well in physical spaces and or online as well. Um, we have the open call for the, the next program. So if you'd like to take part in Format next year um, we were looking for all kinds of proposals <clears throat> from exhibitions to um, uh, participatory work to uh, performative works just challenge us with your ideas the theme is control and you can interrogate that as broadly as, as, as you see fit and um, also challenge the definitions of what it might be and also also there's still time to take part in our mass isolation format program which is taking place on instagram so hashtag mass isolation format and look at at mass isolation format for uh, the curated selection of images. We've had over 30,000 images submitted from over 80 countries um, throughout this lockdown period. Um, and it's even though we're slightly starting to exit our lockdown in the UK, people obviously in countries worldwide are, are still dealing with the situation and, and COVID-19 absolutely hasn't gone away by any means. Um, so it's still relevant to to respond, to respond to that situation through um, images, text, and, and and creative creative ways. So, do check that out. Have a look in the in the comments section. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and sign up to our newsletter for future photo forum talks. But um, really, thank you so much, Andrew, Jagdish, and and um, Seba, um, and Debbie and Neve for for keeping us going behind the scenes as well. Really valued your contributions. It'd be super fantastic to hear more about your work and. All the best with the with the um, work and program of, of reframed and um, yeah we're super happy to support you as well. Thank you for organising this as well. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for the audience. Thanks for everybody to tuning in and all your great comments along the way as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. You'll be able to watch this again later on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you all for coming today. See you at the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>